My name is Lawrence Davidson, and uh, up until May of 2013, I was a professor of Middle East uh, history at um, a place called Westchester University, which is a um, part of the Pennsylvania state system. So, and it's just outside of Philadelphia, uh, if anybody's interested in that. Um, in any case, I have uh, spent an awful lot of time and energy um, in the Middle East, um, and also generally in opposition uh, to American foreign policy in the Middle East. <coughs> my, my research specialization is, in fact, Amer American foreign policy in the Middle East um, from late 19th century to the present. Um, and, so, and I've written, um, for where it's worth, I've written several books on, on this and other things, Islamic fundamentalism, um, even a book on what I call cultural genocide. Um, so, uh, and I have a blog. Uh, it's just scribble, 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 and that's what it is. Okay, so in any case, that's who I am. Now, <clears throat> the experience of the Arab Spring, or the so-called Arab Spring, suggests two scenarios, two um, roads to uh, uh, for the Middle East to go down. Now, of course, it's very hard to make these kinds of generalizations, you never know. But historically speaking, up until the events of the Arab Spring, there seemed to be only one road map for the region, and that was dismal um, oppression of one sort or another, military dictatorships, um, you know, sort of uh, megalomaniacal um, uh, monarchies, or what have you. And the Arab Spring opened a second possibility, one where the uh, popular will um, might exercise a rather novel influence on, um, on events, on political events. So <coughs> um, subsequently, though, the, the events immediately following um, the outbreaks, uh, outbreaks, rebellions, with the possible exception of Tunisia, most of the other um, uh, uprisings were crushed. And you get a return to um, an oppressive, uh, authoritarian kind of uh, historical uh, venue. All right? So I was thinking, what are the chances of changing the odds? <laughs> what, are, what were the uh, what are the uh, um, what are the chances of changing the odds in such a way that the next time there is a popular rebellion, and I'm making the assumption that there will be a next time. I think it's pretty sh pretty certain that there will be future rebellions now that there's a, this sort of precedent. And uh, hopefully it'll be in my lifetime, but you never know. Um, but hopefully, that, you know, I think we can assume that there will be future rebellions. What's the chances of organizing some sort of scenario where the next time um, there is a um, system in place to support those rebellions worldwide? Okay, not just to leave them to their fate within those countries themselves. Because obviously, as long as the, uh, <coughs> as long as the military or the militias or the armed forces support the government, those rebellions are, are going to fail, okay? So, I think that there is such a scenario. And I think it, it, it can tap into um, an experience or a, a system that has a, actually a record, a, a track record, and a record of success. Now, many of you might not appreciate this particular system, but I've worked in it and with it, and it, 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 and it is a potentially powerful, okay? So, this is a system 
which taps into worldwide civil society um, as it expresses itself in support of human rights. And what I'm talking about is the boycott. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Now, whatever you might think of it, it has a track record. <coughs> Uh, in two, at least two cases, and in, in fact in two cases, um, this uh, effort of civil society um, has in fact brought sufficient pressure, at least in one case, to out and out win, or help win, uh, a change in regimes. And that, of course, was in South Africa. And I would remind you that it was the boycott effort that, in fact, was the principal driving force that ultimately changed that regime. Because the Western societies never really brought economic sanctions against South Africa. Okay? So that's a win. That's a track record, a win. And secondly, um, in the case presently, the boycott effort is directed against Israel. Okay? Nothing personal. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think that, um, um, that it's a very good um, likelihood that within a decade, Israel will find itself increasingly isolated uh, within the international community thanks to that boycott, right? Whether you think it's good or bad, it can and will be effective. I think the Israelis understand that. I mean, the Israeli government has actually created um, a, uh, a me you know, an organization within its own interior ministry, I think it is, to essentially fight the boycott, okay? So that's a recognition of its possibility. Right, so you've got you've got this this thing out there. This, this uh, <clears throat> these organizations, and they are organized. These worldwide organizations of civil society um, that can, in fact, through their efforts, even even through passive efforts, not even active efforts, um, impact the cultural relations, even the academic relations potentially the economic relations between various countries. Okay. So <coughs> um, as this process moves forward in the case of Israel and proves its effectiveness, and I actually think it will, um, it could become a model, a model for recurrent action selectively directed against other regimes. It doesn't have to be a Middle Eastern regime. That obviously, in the case of South Africa, it wasn't. But regimes with records of ongoing human rights violations. Okay? Actually, my favorite um, um, candidate for this actually is Egypt. But, you know, maybe you disagree. Um, <coughs> so, what would happen? Okay? What would happen if? a short list of such countries were drawn up. And discussions began on laying the stage, laying a stage um, for relevant BDS efforts against these countries um, at a point in time when it becomes relevant, right? In other words, at a point in time when there's a rebellion and uh, when there's a organized resistance within that country um, that can be linked up at, with an ally to. Now, I think there's um, two provisos here. <coughs> One is you need an organized resistance within those countries of a non-terrorist nature. Um, and one that can make a call, can make an international call for, for help through, uh, through the BDS. 
in both cases, in both the, the South African case and the Israeli case, such organizations existed. Now you can argue the details of, of whether they're truly non-terrorist or whatever, but they were pristine, sufficiently pristine, to get the attention and the following of large numbers of people abroad, particularly in the West. Okay, so one of the provisos is that you need that kind of resistance organization. It has to have a credibility, and it has to make a call. Right. So it doesn't look like you've got a bunch of Western kids, and actually most of these people are kids. I used to be a kid too, actually. I used to be one of them. Um, <coughs> so you don't look like you don't have a bunch of kids in the West running around trying to dictate um, a solution to another country. Okay. That's one of the provisos. And I think in the case of the Middle East, there's a second proviso. And that is the effort as it operates within the West or wherever outside, has to be willing to recognize the legitimacy of religious organizations within Muslim countries as, as legitimately part of that resistance. Okay? And I'm thinking here basically of the Muslim Brotherhood and its actions in Egypt. Um, my feeling is that you simply cannot rely on secular movements alone when it comes to the Middle East. One, for one reason, as we still saw in Egypt, these secular organizations, even though they're, they're pro democracy and they have all the right slogans and they have all, you know, they put out their, their people on the streets, there's, they run the risk that when when, popul when the popular will is really expressed, when you have an election or, and, and it's, and it's um, judged fair and, and uh, objective by outside uh, observers and all that, if the wrong people win, i.e. I, if the religious parties win, then what we saw in Egypt is many of these secular organizations going, going to the military, allying with the government, military against democracy, essentially. And I, you know, that was, for me, that was one of, that was one of the moments um, when, first of all, I lost a lot of friends, Egyptian friends, um, not to violence, but simply by disagreeing with them. And, uh, and that was the moment when I decided that I was going to spend at least half of the rest of my life fishing. <laughs> so, anyway, so I think one of the things, provides it, if this sort of scenario was to work out, um, is that there has to be recognition that, with it, that you have to be culturally sensitive within these countries. That there, 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 uh, there are religious elements, m moderate, I guess, religious elements uh, within these countries that have to be taken into consideration and have to be worked with. There's no other way, as far as I'm concerned. Um, in any case, um, I've actually discussed this with um, uh, people um, associated with the present BDS movement <coughs> and put the bug in their ear. And maybe we can get it on the agenda for, for our future, one of their future conferences. I'm thinking specifically here of Stop the Occupation, which is a very big umbrella, umbre umbrella movement uh, in the United States. Lots of individual organizations, BDS organizations under that umbrella. So there are many ifs and maybes in this scenario. But the, I think the potential is real enough. Okay. Potential. Um, and it promotes hope, at least my hope, um, to look for tactics that have success records and applicability to a broad number of cases 
in what is otherwise a rather dark and dismal present. Thank you. Thank you. Since we're not in a panel, um, if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them now. Um, oh, okay. So what's about the boycott? We'll what have about five it? minutes for questions. What about, I don't understand. I, yeah, I really don't understand the boycott concept very well. I have distinguishing economic sections. No, no, uh, actually, the boycott, the concept of the boycott is much broader than economics. Okay. Okay. Now, I mean, I'm, you might agree or disagree with this as a tactic, but I mean, at, at a certain point in time, you couldn't get a South African athletic team, for instance, okay. out right. and participating. Eventually, they were kicked out of the Olympic organization. Um, you cannot, for instance, today, you cannot get um, an Israeli orchestra coming to Europe or the United States without a protest. People marching around, marching around. But isn't that a failure of democracy that they can't protect them, that they have to cancel them because of the threat of violence? Isn't that? I don't think it's, I don't think there is a threat of violence. I mean, really? there's a threat of disruption. Okay. Have you uh, heard what's going on in Europe? I don't think there's a threat. I don't think there's a threat of violence. Not by the BDS. No, I'm not talking about the BDS. I'm just saying the example you gave, isn't that a failure of democracy that they can't protect? No, I don't think no. so. No, okay. No, yeah. you had a question. Um, I don't know if this is a semantic question, but um, I want to question your use of the word non-terrorist. I think that what you really need is not just that they be non-terrorists, but there has to be an actual, authentic, peaceful resistance movement. Because uh, in the case of the Palestinians, at least, they were most strongly successful in the first intifada. Because as long as there's a violent resistance, it's going to be branded as terrorist. Yeah, yeah. Not. I mean, but you have to. I think you have to be it is, and reasonable. It's, and it's ruining freedom of expression. <coughs> I don't think. That you, I think you have to be reasonable. I mean, these 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 uh, these scenarios. Okay, whether it's South African or in Palestine or whatever. They breed, they don't breed pacifism, okay? They breed resistance, and some of that resistance is going to be violent, and other parts aren't going to be violent. As long as you have, and this is, this is my opinion, okay? as long as you have what can be described as a credible resistance movement whose first, whose first concern is non-cooperation or something like that, making the call, that's fine. But you can't expect that in all cases there's not going to be violence because that's not how the world works. I'll recognize your question. The Israel universities amongst the benefits have the stronghold of, uh, of resistance and objection to the current Israeli government. So it seems to me that boycotting them, boycotting the academics in Israel, who are the, you know, the liberals, the, the avant-garde in yeah. Israel, beats the purpose. Well, I mean, actually, if you look at the boycott in that particular uh, aspect of it, it calls for the boycott of institutions and not individuals. Obviously, if I'm, uh, if I'm a part of this boycott movement and you show up, I don't leave. No? Well, I didn't. I've right? had colleagues refuse. Yeah, that's, well, that's bad boycott. <laughs> bad boycotts. <laughs> right? like bad Muslims or some mm -hmm. bad Jews. Uh, whatever. We have time for two more questions. One from the back there. Uh, regarding Egypt, uh, boycott will never work for Egypt. But to eliminate the aid which give women to kill the people, <laughs> this may be the best especially from the United States or other countries. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, so that's more if, if, this, if, if this really works out, I'll take your name and you can be my uh, consultant <laughs> how to do we're, this. We're time I mean, for one more question here. May I ask you why the situation in Iran during the Green Revolution mm -hmm. was not an example you used? I, you know, it, it, it seems to me that it, if there was 
um, an organization with Interon who could make that call, it would be a viable option. They did. Yeah. They did make the call. I didn't, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Right? I think, I think, you know, Maybe we're I we're still good for two since, questions. Since there were order, sanctions in please. place, the boycott right. would have been redundant. Can I just ask no, you? I recognize you. Um, I'm active in the field of social entrepreneurship in the Middle East. Yeah. And side yeah, comment. Yeah, I remember. And you're talking about tactics and ways of bringing some of these um, these grassroots movements together, be it political, from the human rights level, women rights issues, social, yeah, environmental, yeah. name it. One of my biggest critique at this conference is that there is not enough time given to people to talk about the other stories that are coming out of the Middle East. Yeah, sure. It's not just about nuclear issues, not just about right. all the other stuff that's going on. There are tremendous opportunities to engage people right. at the local level. Right. Why is that not done? And where does your story fit into that? Well, actually, I mean, in, in, in terms of the history of the boycott, um, there's an enormous amount of exchange of information on, a, on the non-governmental level. Obviously, the governmental level, you can't talk. But on the non-governmental level, not only, not only with Palestinians, but also with Israelis, all right? Um, right. My, la my last comment is, for better or worse, if you look at the organizations in the United States, that are standing against the occupation, most of them are run or organized or headed by American Jews. Uh, my name is Yi Yi Chen. I uh, run one of the uh, five or six uh, uh, think tanks on the Middle East uh, uh, issues in China. And uh, it's uh, the newest one. And uh, we are uh, responsible, uh, among all other things, uh, a commissioned uh, um, a project that uh, will provide China's own version of the uh, uh, conflict resolution between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Exactly. It will come out uh, probably in another five years. <laughs> <laughs> many of uh, many of the think tank people in this city are uh, among our advisors and uh, researchers, oh, and we want to stand on top of the giant's shoulder, which is uh, uh, this town's research people and. Uh, we, uh, luckily, China does not have all the uh, pressures uh, with its own uh, unique uh, uh, political system. Uh, it's not subject to lobby uh, persuasion. So it might have a uh, relatively fair, uh, at least among, in, by view of the, uh, uh, our 22 Arab countries, uh, a fair, relatively fair uh, solution for land swapping, Jerusalem issues, and other details. Uh, that's my background. And uh, I'm very glad to see uh, Professor Davidson because I was here three years ago. Oh, right. And uh, this is, uh, this is a, a one of the very rare occasions uh, when I give a talk in this city. I don't need to worry too much. Uh, and uh, because I have an Israel study background, and uh, uh, this is uh, one of the forum where we only see one walk out, right, so far. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, in Professor Davidson's talk probably caused the whole room moving to syrup, uh, which I did encounter in, among, uh, in many of the other think tanks where uh, the population is not that, that diversified. So as, a, as, a, as a Jewish studies scholar of 20 years, I, of course, I, you know I can sense who are among the Israelis' friends and who are not that friendly in this room, right? But anyway, that's my background. Uh, I, I, uh, I proposed, and I realized, uh, like last year only, that three years ago my talk was on YouTube. So I have to be very cautious when I'm talking now. <laughs> uh, my talk I submitted actually is a, uh, a paper under review by the journal Middle East Policies. Uh, what I really want to do right now is uh, using my uh, 17 minutes to uh, uh, read, using two minutes to read the, the abstract so you know what I'm talking about. It's going to come out on the journal. If you're interested in this topic, come look for me. But I want to uh, use the rest of the time to link what I've heard during the day before now and uh, uh, link it to the Middle East uh, uh, situation and uh, to provide some of my thoughts. Since we have record on, on, on videos, I can go back and watch myself. Uh, 
my paper was on the dynamic of uh, foreign policy making in China, I'll read my abstract. Contrary to many Western assumptions, uh, I believe that foreign policy decisions made by today's Chinese government are transparent and predictable. This is due to the common psychological basis of the entire nation and built-in mechanism of checks and balances inherited from thousands of years of civil officials practicing merit-based administration. The rationale of these decisions is the Chinese Communist Party's willingness to pay a price for pride. Okay, P for P, P to P, price for pride. I'll explain a little bit. Um, on behalf of the nation, since the one-party regime is here to stay, by the way, I'm not a Communist Party member, so I'm not speaking for the party, I'm just analyzing. Since the one-party regime is here to stay for the foreseeable future, understanding these characteristics of China's foreign policy decision-making uh, uh, paves the way for better cooperation be between the U.S. and China worldwide, particularly in the Middle East. This will allow the two countries to do many things in the region without pressing on each other's sensitivities, which uh, understanding one another better will help facilitate. So that's my conclusion. This is a 20-page paper. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tie this uh, uh, conclusion, price for pride, uh, to some of the themes I've heard so far in today's conference. One of the themes is uh, uh, civil war is brutal. I heard this three times during today's different sessions uh, presentation. So I, every time I ask, well, civil war is brutal, so other non-civil war are not brutal? I think all wars are brutal, right? But uh, in the history of human wars, with an uh, accurate record of the uh, death toll, actually the brutals, the most brutal civil war happened in China in between 18... Oh, go ahead. Oh, between 1853 to 1861. That's the Taiping Rebellion. Okay. So, uh, 1853 to 1861. If you will, please remember this year. 1853. And, uh, and the war is between a self-claimed Christian, uh, also claimed himself to be the younger brother of Jesus Christ, uh, leading a large uh, army uh, fighting against the government and the multiple, several million. I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but you can wiki it or Google it, see, see the Wikipedia. It is uh, not arguably the largest casualty. I think 11 million people die, died during that war, about eight years. Okay, and that's actually 13 years after the first Opium War in China, which is 1840. Okay. The first opium war is between the British uh, and the Chinese army. And uh, uh, two or three warships uh, uh, roaming are against uh, up where the Yangtze River and killed, I mean, take control of almost the whole river and then the whole government. And there are unfair treaty being signed. And then a few years later, the second opium war. Why do I mention this? Because this is. In, instilled into the memory of the whole nation for the last 150 years. If you ask any Chinese uh, whether they, uh, they, if they speak Ch Chinese better than their English, like me, um, everyone will know the Opium War. It's like the Holocaust for the Jewish people, the Nakba for the Palestinians. It's, it's there, it's the, the collective memory of uh, our nation. And uh, starting from 1840, uh, the, whole, the, the, the China, the government, the last di dynastic that government, Qing dynasty, is in a total chaos, Balagan, mess. It's everywhere, and uh, it's uh, uh, since then it's, it reminds me a little, uh, a lot about today's situation in the Middle East. Uh, there are imperialist powers, uh, twenty of them, the most powerful ones, eight of them. When they're burned, the uh, Winter Palace. Uh, of the uh, uh, empire and uh, looted everything. Right now, this moment, there are more uh, artifacts actually uh, in this country and in the European continent, uh, more of those uh, 
uh, artifacts from that garden palace than in China. And it's still the situation. And the Chinese are getting richer and richer as individuals. Uh, one of the things the typical would do was to go on the media and trying to bid some of the things from the front, from the Britain, from the US, paying billions of dollars, not millions. We're talking about a huge number here. So it's a national collective memory of uh, humiliation. And uh, I, I believe that um, uh, the Middle East is experiencing a similar situation, but only 150 years later than the Chinese. And uh, so for that reason, the Chinese, I think, have a better understanding on the historical point of view, because it's a nation of uh, over 3,000 years of written history, uh, about what's going on with the Middle East. And it's, it's in a, the, the whole psychology uh, of the Muslim or Islamic tradition or religion or culture is getting into a downward deadlock spiral, uh, as what happened back in the 1800s, uh, mid to late 1800s in China. And what happened? Uh, what uh, uh, another very important thing uh, uh, is since uh, the Chinese uh, culture got s into such a trouble, a lot of the elites of the country uh, decided uh, different section of the country do different things. Young people go to Europe, go to Japan, go to come to this country to learn about the advanced technologies and. Uh, about the civilization of different culture, try to go back to save China. I'll, I'll have a comparison between the ISIS comebacks. So, uh, and then the government do a lot of things too. The government uh, try to establish modern universities in China, uh, trying to solve uh, the weakness of the technology of the government, the weakness of the uh, economy, the agriculture-based economy, trying to convert it to a Industri uh, industrialized economy, trying to strengthen its uh, weaponry uh, industry, and uh, at that background, uh, um, the university I'm right now, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer asked me to introduce myself, so the university that you read, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, is one of the two universities established by the Qing Dynasty, the last uh, dynastic government to handle this problem by the government. And uh, the other university I went to, Peking University, is another trial. That was going. To, that university was its first established, trying to educate uh, young Chinese to learn foreign languages. It's a very simple task. The first beginning. And this university I'm working on right now is educate Chinese young engineers to build weapons and and, and, and gunships and boats. So that's uh, that's the goal. And a lot of uh, individuals went to Europe, and uh, tons of them. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of them, went to Europe, spent a few years, and and uh, uh, migrated back to China and started uh, another revolution, which is uh, the origin and the, the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party today. <laughs> so these are the people, um, as uh, in the other session, uh, a Syrian uh, honorable guest mentioned. These are. The, like the ISIS uh, returnees coming from Europe, from the US, from other advanced societies, they bring their own expertise back to the ISIS, the Islamic State in, in Iraq and Syria. And uh, from my point of view, I mean, looking at the, if you are uh, at all curious about Chinese modern history, uh, how the Communist Party as a, it, it initially uh, branded as a bandit, a group of bandits, uh, or terrorists because they use uh, suicidal techniques to bomb the, uh, the stronger army of the, the nationalists. And uh, even the nationalists, um, 20 years earlier, the, the, the re Chinese revolution, the modern revolution happened in 19, 1911, is also started with a lot of terrorist activity. And the weaker using bombs to bomb uh, government officials and, and all the different techniques that you read commonly today among, uh, on the media, like similar as the, uh, what uh, uh, Arafat will do, which is praised by the uh, uh, Mao Zedong in the 1960s or even the 70s when he visited China. Uh, so this is, uh, consider him as a hero and the leader of the, uh, the liberation of the Palestinian army. A Palestinian people. See, this is a tradition. As long as, in according to the definition of terrorism, as long as there are asymmetric powers struggle 
they're always going to be terrible. It's, it's, today is in ISIS. Before, uh, in China, there is in the Nationalist Party, Communist Party. But looking at the growth and maturation, and eventually the uh, success of uh, the Chinese Commun Communist Party taking over the whole China and uh, push the uh, Nationalists to the Taiwan Island. Uh, uh, by that standard, I'm not very optimistic in terms of, <laughs> of uh, seeing ISIS being eliminated as a power, as long as you call it a state, uh, in the very near future. It's, a, it's a, probably, we're going to be there if they have enough elites coming from Europe and the US, uh, have enough uh, self-structured administration and guidance, have their own vision, even though the, a bunch of fatwa by a bunch of different uh, uh, religious leaders is not considered as a, uh, uh, centralized and powerful enough, but if that's, that was the situation back in the 1930s with the Communist Party too. Until they were pushed, uh, the, uh, the whole group of 40,000 people or more was eliminated, almost to only 2,000 people, all the way moving, migrating uh, thousands of miles from uh, southern China to the northeast part of, uh, the northwest part of China. There are only a few thousand uh, if you wish to call it the, the Red Army left. And then they survived by, by, by building up the new ideology, attracting a lot of people, more people from the nationalist controlled majority, 99% of China's territory back then, and other people still coming back constantly from the US, from Europe, with all the technologies and expertise, still building from that few thousand people back to what you see today's ruler. Uh, on the throne, if you will, in China. And, and it was tragic for decades. Uh, that was really nice, actually. <laughs> uh, for decades, for the, for the Chinese uh, uh, civilization or population as a whole, as a country. I mean, uh, if you visit or talk to any of the Chinese uh, my age or even older than me, and talking about their history of their family, every, almost every family has some suffering by the regime of the Communist Party. I, I'm not uh, hesitating, even though I work for a Chinese think tank, I'm not hesitating to put that on YouTube. Well, YouTube is not accessible in China anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the party today actually admit all the difficulties they caused, all the problems and the tragedies uh, by the, because of the ideology of the Communist, communist ideology, all the extreme uh, measures they take trying to control the country. But eventually, today, you, you come to the city or go to any European country, you talk to the leader, the elite, everyone is focusing on how great a power China is. Instead of talking how many people were killed or committed suicide in the Cultural Revolution only 40 years ago, people tend to forget a lot of the bad things. So, with that view, if the I ISIS survive this rounds and rounds of uh, so-called uh, elimination, as long as this country is not putting uh, boots on the ground over there, I think they're going to uh, last quite a few years or even decades to come. Because it's, this is a region that uh, not many powers in the world uh, want to send their soldiers there. Not, not China. China is still poor. and. Uh, color. <laughs> still, still poor and, uh, and uh, trying to balance uh, what we should do and we should not do. And, and uh, I, uh, com coming back to the, to the uh, uh, prize for pride. So because of that long history, of about 100 years of history of humiliation in front of the imperialistic powers, that sounds familiar, huh? If you read some of the ISIS state, uh, the Western powers, China decided to revolutionize itself and become a self-reliant power, and it happened. Uh, so that's another reason why China sympathized a lot with, uh, with China always believed the Iranians will and want to have their nuclear power, because that's what happened to China, to suffer whatever difficulties you have to have their, your own nuclear power. And, and, uh, and uh, that happened. So all this uh, pride, China today uh, being independent, uh, played a lot of role actually in terms of China's conflict with Japan because that was one of the last superpower 
trying to, uh, invaded China and gave, gave a lot of information. And also, for this reason, that China voted vetoed four times uh, Western power trying to send troops into Syria. And uh, because the situation back then, back there, was actually way more complicated than uh, the media portrayed four years ago, three years ago, actually. Today, everyone in the world probably in this field learned that the situation is very complicated. But back then, it's always saying the good, by, the good guys against the bad guy. The bad guy is Assad, and the good guys are the Free Syrian Army and all the, uh, all, all the other forces. Which is, today, everyone admits this is not true. It's, it's com way more complicated. And for this kind of pride that China wants to maintain, it's willing to sacrifice a lot of, uh, uh, in terms of voting, in, the, in vetoing in the UN, and in terms of uh, economic uh, benefits or interests, China is paying a lot of price, and willing to pay more, because many of the monopolized uh, uh, state-owned enterprises actually are also owned by the party. So it's uh, uh, the, the most powerful uh, business entities are willing to give up on many of the benefits for longer term benefits, for the, not, not only for, the, for itself, but for the party and for the country. So it's, it's something uh, 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 called price, you know, willing to pay, you know, the, all the other different sources. Uh, I guess I'll stop at there. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Thank you again for that. We have five minutes for questions, please. Questions only, not statements. I appreciate the ideas, but the questions, please. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, a very uh, provocative uh, presentation. I want to ask you, since you made the analogy between, the, uh, uh, between China and the ISIS, uh, and you refer to the Chinese ideology several times, and of course we all know the very shallow ISIS ideology. Could you, um, since I'm a student of policy, policy planning all my life, um, what are the values and the ethical basis of what you call the Chinese ideology? And how does that compare to the what we know about the ethical grounds of ISIS. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a very. Well, I raised that comparison and similarity uh, only today, actually, a few hours ago. So I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to take a scholarly responsibility for comparing those because uh, back in the early years of communist party, it's always uh, 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 the 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 ideology of communism is actually very shallow and simple, you know. You know, communism is actually everyone, they work on it if they want to work, and then everything being shared. And, 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 and uh, it's, a, it's a response to the uh, suffering of the people, not having a good life uh, uh, back then, 150 years ago, so 100 years ago. So it's, uh, uh, the ISIS ideology is uh, it's simple and shallow, as you said, but it's, uh, it's ideology is the only ideology, like religion is religion, it's, it's only have its own goal. So once they gather the enough resources and powers to uh, construct a, a country, a, a modern state, the ideology is no longer that uh, easy. Because in China, nobody believes in communism today, even among the, all the members. But it's, uh, it's there as a symbol, it's like a cross, it's a symbol, like a David Stark. It's a symbol, it doesn't mean it have to be anything. It's, it's, Go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, does it mean that China sees ISIS, the state of ISIS, as a potential ally due to common no. history and no. mutual understanding? No. As I said, China, Chinese uh, Communist Party members, uh, 80 million of them, they not necessarily believe in communism per se, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's, um, Symbol to try to the, the Chinese dream, trying to revive the Chinese no, 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 no. power. My question is: You spoke throughout the, uh, throughout your lecture. You spoke about the similarity. The similarity is the ISIS naturally and China. Uh, automatically uh, cause uh, alliances. China do not do alliances with anyone. So what's the reason for for China for, for Chinese vetoes, then? Uh, the for, for what's the reason for what for vetoes? 
But the video has nothing to do with ISIS. It's back then, like four or five years no, ago. No. Uh, that's for Syria. Sending UN troops to Syria. Not, yeah. not about ISIS. ISIS today, uh, as uh, China is uh, uh, trying to explain what happened in Syria, is China is having, a, among the, the scholars or the policymakers, having a debate what exactly is ISIS. It's terrorism organization. For that, China agrees with the US or all the Western world. But is it one organization with one leader, with one ideology, and one armed force? It's not that simple. It's a lot of people, and it's changing any moment. Right now we're talking, they're having people flying there, and there are people, uh, uh, France police or British police is trying to stop them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the provocative comparison, but I have a question about one of them in particular. You said that uh, you mentioned uh, that the, uh, American support for fighting uh, ISIS, that without it, they would, uh, they would might persist the way China persisted. Are you saying, number one, that if America had given Chiang Kai-shek a blank check, that the communists would not have won? And are you saying that if we give uh, the, the opponents of ISIS a blank check, that ISIS would be defeated? Well, oh, thank you for the Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, uh, <laughs> Chiang Kai-shek has a free uh, Syrian army, you know. It's, it's, it's a lot of comparative <laughs> lessons to be learned. It's not a repetition of the history. It's never. It's it's well, the, the scale of the Chinese Communist Party is way bigger than the uh, than this ISIS. But it's a it's a, it's a lot of there are a lot of points need to be pondered upon. It will be helpful for the uh, for the policymakers not to bluntly say that ISIS is a terrorist organization. We're going to kill it. It's easy. Send troops. Okay. Thank you. One more short question. China is a member of the P5 plus 1. What are you doing there? What, what is your orientation? What is your objective? In I, I don't speak in on behalf of China. <laughs> I'm sorry, what is the Chinese? <laughs> China, Chinese, uh, first of all, acknowledges, uh, only a few months ago, the leadership of the war by the US. This is something that many of the policymakers in this town do not believe, but which is actually they're wrong. China acknowledges the leadership of the U.S. because China does not have all the experts to do deal with all the different nitty gritties in all the regions in the world. So U.S. leads, so that's why we are plus one. We're not plus one, but we're among the five. Yeah, among the five. But China is have, have no very very uh, proactive role in the Iranian uh, peace uh, nuclear talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bobby Fardanish, and uh, I enjoyed the presentation tremendously. And uh, uh, I would like to tell you a few words about my background. There is a reason why I'm sharing this with you: is that uh, I am from Iran, and uh, a big chunk of my education was in Europe, in Switzerland. Then I came to to University of Colorado. Uh, when I came to the United States, I didn't know a word in English. I truly didn't know. I remember in the airplane, I learned the uh, good morning. So when I got there at night, I was saying good morning, and people thought I'm making fun. I just being funny by saying good morning at night. And then, uh, truly, after a while, I have done huge, huge mistakes. And it was very costly for me. Uh, and some of the modern ones I would like to share with you. One of them was that I remember, I mean, I have hundreds of them, I can tell you from now until tomorrow. But two of them was, one time I did go to a uh, restaurant and I said, they said, what, what do you want? And I said, I want uh, uh, salad. They said, what is it, what is it you want? I said, salad, salad. And then they couldn't understand it, so I have to, point my finger at someone who was eating that food, which was salad. So I said, salad. Now I remember I should not say salad. I should say salad, salad. <laughs> then I said, what do you want to drink? I said, milk. The poor guy couldn't understand. I have to show it to him. This is what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, milk. So I learned that in English language, if you want to speak correctly, you have to stretch the words. Milk. <laughs> <laughs> then you're okay. And in this understanding was when I did go to class, uh, I used to stand up as a respect to my teacher. And honestly, the teacher thought I'm making fun of him <laughs> by just trying to disturb the classroom. And then, what, why, why are you standing? Well, I don't know. Why don't you don't know? 
Why are you standing? Sit down. Uh, it was so polite to sit down in front of the teacher, so it was very difficult. One of the uh, Chinese students, uh, you know, Chinese students actually, or people from that part of the world, as a respect to the teacher, do not tend to ask questions because maybe one of the reasons is uh, they do not want to put the teacher on the spot. But again, the teacher thinks that maybe the student doesn't care to learn. So there are a lot of misunderstandings. Gradually, that came to my mind that this type of misunderstanding can spill over into negotiations. And also negotiations between countries, and it going, is going to cause a lot of problems. And I was always hoping how we can minimize this type of uh, misunderstanding among different uh, cultures. So what I did is that actually I did write a book about the potential misunderstandings. Well, the base of the misunderstanding is that uh, we do not, when we talk to each other, we do not talk the same language. And that is going to spill into negotiations. And then if you do not have a good understanding and good interpersonal relations, it's going to affect our negotiation process. And the outcome most probably is not going to be very good. And uh, potentially, uh, many, I believe, I, I do not know too much about politics, but I would guess that many of the problems that today we have in this world is because we do not really communicate with each other. We do not, uh, everybody is thinking about what they want to say rather than trying to understand what is the issue that this other party is trying to convey. Uh, there has been some of the examples I give you, they were rather interesting or maybe funny, but I do know that many, for example, of the problems of airplane crashes is because of the miscommunication between tower control and the pilot. And I do not want to bore you on that. I have done an in-depth study about, uh, was it was in March 1977, that a contributing factor to the crash of two huge airlines smashing into each other in Canary Islands was because of the word OK. The word OK had different meaning to different cultures. So putting all of these things aside is that with regard to uh, uh, verbal communication, uh, again, the word that we use, it may not be the same. I, uh, I may say a word that could mean one thing and to you could mean another thing, as I just give you the example of OK. OK to someone means that I did understand what you said, but doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you or not. But in some other culture, when you say OK, that means I did understand what you said, and I'm agreeing to it. Mm -hmm. Aside from that one is that in the negotiations, there are a lot of nonverbal communications that are even, in my view, are even more important than verbal communications. Let me give an example of it. Uh, business uh, is my field. Uh, I do teach at the University of Maryland, marketing business management. Uh, many times, American folks value time very much. They, they, they associate time with money. So if they want to come and make a deal with you, they would say, well, I do not want to waste your time, and I do not want you to waste my time. So if I have a contract, well, hello, how are you? And uh, chat uh, for a few minutes, and let's get down to business. So this is the way that American folks would perceive a good negotiation skills. Let's say folks from Greece or from uh, Saudi Arabia, they would see it differently. Or folks from South American countries would see it differently. They would believe that time is part, is part of life and uh, let us create some trust among each other. Let us have a better understanding. And gradually, when we create that trust, that base, then we can move on into negotiations, and we are going to have a better negotiations. Well, I'm not very much here to judge which one is better and which one is not, although I think I have my own opinion on it. Uh, but the thing is the misunderstanding. If you are an American folks and you would like to get down to business because you want to respect your time and my time, uh, I do see it differently. I would say, 
All he wants to do is to get my money. I, I don't want to deal with this person. And then if I want to, if you come to my country, I want to show you the city, the monument, the, my family to get to know you before we get to the negotiations, then you would say, this guy is not really serious. He's just going around <laughs> the bush and not getting down to business. I don't know what's wrong with this guy. So that is a potential for misunderstandings. And there are a lot of things that we do, and we do not mean it. And it's going to be uh, offensive to the other party. And uh, one of them could be proxemics or distance that we keep from one person to another. And uh, for example, you are an American gentleman. And then if I come to you, uh, American folks do have a comfort zone. Don't get too much close to them. You are going to make them not very comfortable. So if you want to talk to an American folks, stand here. And if you have a, something to show me, then I can stand here and see it. But I know that if I get any closer to you, I'm going to make you very uncomfortable. And that is not conducive to the good negotiations. Folks from South American countries, they practically touch each other when they talk. They even hold hands and they put their hands on their shoulder, and this is not common here. So this is with regard to uh, proxemics. With regard to the eye contacts, uh, uh, American folks, they love to uh, have eye contacts with the person uh, who is giving a speech, seminar, or is a teacher, or whoever. In many other countries, uh, such as the Middle East, uh, is that when someone of a higher authority is talking, the students or those people should put their head down because they feel otherwise it's going to be offensive to them. So that is going to be, again, a potential for misunderstandings. Handshakes is another area of misunderstanding that I could share with you stories about the fact that uh, how handshakes cause problems. And kissing on the cheeks could cause you know, is there a misunderstanding? American folks like to kiss one time on the cheek and walk away. Uh, Middle Easterns like to kiss two times. Belgium and French like to kiss three times. And believe me, I'm not exaggerating. Sometimes when I'm still in a party or gathering, I see a friend, American friend, to come and you know, I you know, I'm a single lady for some. I kiss and she walks away. I say, hey, wait a minute, come back. <laughs> 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 that is all misunderstandings. Um, we, we, how about time? How about time? Uh, there's a, a story that uh, uh, they did not let it to get into pub public, but uh, I heard that there was uh, a group of people from England came to Colombia to make a deal. And uh, uh, British people are very much on time. You know, you have to be right on time. You cannot be late. Otherwise, it's going to be offensive. But to make the story short. Uh, that group of people did fly from England to Colombia for a business deal, and then the Colombian counterpart didn't show up. You know, they wanted to be about two or three hours late. Not a big deal. <laughs> and then everybody shout at the person who managed all of these things, and this person got so upset he went to bathroom and he committed suicide. He killed himself because of the way that they made everybody jump over that person because what you, you brought us from England to here and nobody's showing up. Did you make fun of us? And uh, so they got, again, got so upset. And I did read some reports of it and they didn't let it to get into public. Um, uh, uh, people from the Middle East, as I'm sure you know, uh, well, half an hour late, it's, it's too early, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours, then now we are talking about, and to be honest with you, when I was in Colorado, I had some people from Switzerland, they are known as a low context culture. Oh my God, if you are one minute late, one second late, it's offensive to them. And I, uh, I did have a, a couple of French uh, folks, uh, uh, Swiss folks. Every time I had a party, I told them, I can come to our home at six o'clock. Believe me, I'm not exaggerating. They would arrive to my home about 10 to 6 and sit at the door and not to get out. And they come here right at, right at 2 seconds to 6 o'clock, they would ring the bell. And I said to my wife, you know what, every time you want to make sure your clock is, is correct, <laughs> <laughs> and invite them, then you know that that is the time. And then, now they would come and then 
we did have a people from Saudi Arabia or uh, from <laughs> the part of the Middle East. I said, come at 6 o'clock, they would show up at 9.30. <laughs> and I said, my God. And then they would get offended because we already served food at, let's say, 9 o'clock. <laughs> so I played a game. I said to my Swiss friends, come at 9.30. And I said to my <laughs> people from Saudi Arabia, come at 2 o'clock like in the afternoon. <laughs> 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 But one of the important things that I would like to share with you, based on my own experience, is something by uh, a gentleman from Harvard University. His name is Mr. Dr. James Lee. He came up with a notion which is called SRC, uh, Self-Reference Criterion. That means that one of the problems in negotiations and interpersonal relations is that because we tend to judge other people based on our own beliefs and attitudes. And that's not right. We do not have the right to make ourselves as a benchmark to judge other people. We have to respect the way that other people are doing things. If we do not agree with it, that's fine. But we can at least respect it and, and try to understand that why people behave in certain way. As long as we have this type of understanding, then we can have a better negotiation. How about, uh, yeah. So uh, th that is uh, something that I would like you to, to live with. Uh, I did write a book recently about misunderstanding in, uh, nego nego in uh, misunderstanding negotiations, in marketing, in business, in interpersonal relations, in aviations, and all of these things that how misunderstanding is spilled over into causing a lot of problems. The name of the book is called Cross-Cultural Communications with Success. And uh, that book has been used in a couple of universities right now. And uh, it's all based on my own experience. And the good thing about that book is that I do not go around the bush. I get right to the point and say, this is the problem. And this is how, how is the source of the problem and how we can solve it. Uh, again, I'm going to stop here a little bit early because I would like to uh, make myself available for folks if they want to share with me their experiences rather than to simply ask a question so you would have more time. And uh, I am here if you have any questions. Or, yeah, do, we, do we have any international folks coming from other countries who experienced coming here and uh, had a problem to come here, sir? Uh, my question to you is, there is a, a very gray and fine hair between uh, this kind of studies. And uh, some people accuse that this is really giving basis or disseminating uh, stereotypes and actually reach to the point of even bigotry against some others. And especially someone in the 1960s or 70s, uh, Hall, H-A-L-L, uh, was known to be that and he was attacked. And how, how, do you, how do you answer that, that this, this kind of uh, studies are, uh, are dangerous because it, it promotes um, stereotypes against certain groups? Well, depending on how you are looking at it, uh, we could look at it as a stereotyping. A stereotyping has a bad connotation. So what we are discussing here does not have a bad connotation. What we are talking about is to understanding the differences. As long as we are open to understand our differences, then we can communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the stereotyping. Uh, the fact that Swiss people, they appreciate more time, uh, you know, I don't think you can call it a stereotyping. A stereotyping has a negative connotations, but if someone has a respect for time, I don't think it's called a stereotyping. Yes. I think just to follow up on that question, you know, it's interesting because in my travels, I've also encountered a very wide degree of variation between people in the same country and people in the same city. Um, you know, for example, things as simple as uh, as customs for touching, especially between the genders. I'm part Lebanese on my father's side, and I find people who will absolutely not shake their hands with me, and people who want to kiss me on both cheeks. <laughs> and the same country, same village, same, you know. And so I think with things like that, and even, even in terms of affection within the same sex or gender, um, you'll find people who are very comfortable with it, people who are not. And I think with 
globalization, it's making it an increasingly <coughs> complex international field to navigate. Sometimes I don't know whether I should even offer my hand to shake. Sometimes I just do this. Sometimes I just wait for the other person to initiate. So that's my experience. It's, it's very, very hard to pinpoint sometimes. Sure. There are two people that uh, they have <coughs> the two divergent, and divergent views. And one of them is uh, Dr. Cutler from uh, uh, Western, Northwestern University. He believes that the world is becoming more differentiated because we do have a different expectation. We want to look different than other people. So the way that we are going to act or behave or wear clothing or automobile or whatever is going to be different than other people. So we are going to go to our differentiation. We are going to be moving to our more complex path as the one that you suggested. And then there is another gentleman by the name of Theodore Levitt. He's a, uh, Dr. Levitt is from Harvard University who has a conflicting view with this gentleman. He would say that no, because the world is becoming smaller, so we are learning from each other, so there is more harmony of what we are doing. Uh, which of the two is correct uh, is really, uh, is, is a complex issue to answer and uh, in some, so one thing I would suggest is just to be cognizant of it, to be observant, you know, be alert of what's going on and what is it that you should do, making sure that our behavior would not be offensive to other people. That's the main goal, the fact that because we are becoming a global village and we are interacting much more with other people from different backgrounds, so we need to be more cognizant of our behavior with other people in order to be effective. I have one quick question before you. He's got a full five minutes after this. So, so, so one of the observations I've had in international relations and, and with Asia in particular is that um, the translators, you throw a translator between what you just said and me, um, you could start a war. Yes. Okay. What's your experience with translation issues since that's what we're talking about in the Middle East? That's an excellent point. Uh, the duty of the uh, a translator is to convey the exact message to the other party. But is it, would it be the exact word or the exact message? That are, this is two different things. Idea or message. Exactly, <laughs> you've got it. Now, uh, let me give an example of it. Uh, is that uh, uh, people from Italy do not like instructions saying, do not touch this, for example. Because if you say, do not touch this or warning, they say, don't tell me what to do, what not to do. I'm going to touch it. Again, many of them, of course, I'm talking in general, not that every Italian would do that, but many uh, Italian folks do not like this type of um, uh, warning stated down there. You have to put it in a different connotations. But now, if you want to translate that one from English language to Italian language and give it to them uh, through the translation, it may not have a good result. So would you change this thing, please do not touch it, or just say, do not touch it, which of the two? So that is the, uh, one of the complex issues with translation that Thank would cause you. You've indulged me enough. I yield to the young lady. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to share my experience and also respond to what you said because I traveled a bit. And uh, when um, my last travel was in the US, and when I arrived in the US, you know, I was so enthusiastic about the way. Where are you from, if I may ask? From France. OK, OK. I was very enthusiastic about the way Americans are so open socially and how they hug each other when you met them for the first time and how they're like, oh my god, how are you? What have you done today? And you know, I just arrived, I don't know these people, and I'm like, oh wow, they are so interested into me, you know. <laughs> I figured that my American boyfriend told me, no, but you know, this is just a, a way of acting, but it doesn't mean that these people actually care. <laughs> In all of this, uh, I mean, ordinary behavior, you also see the way people think. And um, my interpretation out of that is that uh, American are people who like to be effective and go right to the point. And so they're going to make a lot of, like in French, what we call blah blah, you know, <laughs> around the real thing. But it's actually just to say, 
Okay, okay, uh, contact is nice. Now let's go right to the point. While um, my resident friends, you know, this whole formality would be very important and you would be judged on it to see if you're uh, highly educated or not, if you're part of which part of the society are you from? And you would be judged upon that, and that is very important. And so I think it's funny and that actually it uh, takes part also to the wealth of our culture. If I did be sure it's one more thing, we tell me to try and do the other. Oh, you've, you've got a full five. Good, 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 good. So no, I just three minutes. Had five yeah. minutes, I had five minutes. No, I still have five minutes. That's great. Um, <laughs> one thing that uh, uh, there is a gentleman by the name of Edward T. Hall. He divided countries into parts, low context culture, high context culture. And then in a low context culture, the words, the message, the meaning of the message is in the word that we use. In the Middle East, we say one thing and we mean one another thing. That doesn't mean that we are dishonest. It's just that's the way that we communicate. Uh, we have to understand that would be high context culture. People from Greece would fall into that category, again, generally speaking. In Sweden, in, uh, in uh, uh, Switzerland, in Germany, and to some extent in France, we tend to take the words as they come, particularly in Paris, in the northern part, not in the southern part. Now, don't quote me, this is what I heard, that Swedish people are very much of the low context culture, that means they look at the words, no interpretation of the word. For example, if you're walking down the street, you could say, so excuse me, do you have time? Do you have a, do you have a watch? And then the person says, yes, I do have a watch, actually it's beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then or you could say, hi, hi, how are you doing? You know, oh. I don't have time to tell you now. We can make an appointment. I could come and see, see you and tell you how I'm doing. <laughs> or another thing is that you are in the elevator, and then you stand up, and then the elevator door is open. Is it going up? Yes, of course it does. Have a good day. They close the door, and they go up. If you want to come in, say, I want to come in. Why you ask me, it's going up. Yes, it's going up. If you want to come in, say, I want to come in. So the word you have to, there is no interpretation. Again, that has a lot to do with international negotiations between countries. You mean one thing, they, in, they interpret it differently, and that could be dangerous. This is what is so sensitive to communication, and we have to be cognizant of what's going on between communication of two people. Uh, did I say correctly that in France uh, they kiss three times? Or uh, what it depends. Uh, depends. Yes, it depends on the region. Yeah. Where I'm from, it's too. Okay, so, so <laughs> and I'm, I'm it's four. Oh my wow. God! Yeah. What part of it? What part of France? Four times. Maybe I like to go that way. Sorry. Listen, you uh, explain uh, the Iranian uh, custom of tarmuf. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's a wonderful example of the uh, gentleman just mentioned. Come on in and be our guest. They have three minutes. We still have oh, three minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Taro, that's an excellent point. Uh, that in Iran, there is something that we say, uh, Taro. Taro means that you come to my home and I would insist that you stay there. That doesn't mean that I really mean it. But however, this doesn't mean that I am not telling the truth. It just means create cohesion, to bring closeness, to friendship. But it is up to you to understand whether I really mean it or not. And this is why it's called high countries culture. It's much more difficult to understand people of high countries culture. And it's going to be a big misunderstanding between high countries culture countries and low countries culture countries. In fact, one of the, uh, my American friends, uh, yeah, uh, did go with another one of his friends to make a contract in Saudi Arabia. And in Saudi Arabia, they did go to the home of someone, and then that person insisted to stay here at night for dinner. So the minute he said, why don't you stay here? That American friend who was not familiar with the culture said, oh, I love to. 
he stayed. And the poor guy was not ready. He just said it just as a formality to be closed. So when they go out, they go out, they must say that, why did you stay? He said, because he told me to stay. He said, this doesn't mean because he told you, you should say yes. So I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. All right. Well, yeah, yeah, one more thing. Yeah, there is a book by the name, by the, the by, by uh, a lady, her name is Deborah Tani, if you like to write mm -hmm. it down. She's talking about the very, very same thing, that the Greek family uh, tell to their daughter, please go out with your friends while they didn't mean it. And then the American friends standing next to that girl, they got confused that because the girl decided not to go out. And then uh, the American friends said, well, your father gave you the permission to go out while you're not going out. He said, no, 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 I don't feel like going out. But again, it was a good communication between the father and the daughter. Now, give me just five seconds. Uh, and then the, the question is that, uh, that that was raised in this book, that why do you go around the bush? Well, it has a lot of benefits. Because if the father said to the daughter, if you go out, I, I punish you, or whatever it is, then he would put the daughter down. Or vice versa, if the daughter said to the father, oh, you are telling me not to go out, you are not, you can't tell me I'm 18 year old, I can do anything I want to, then she would put her father down in front of other people. So that kind of a communication was very friendly, was very effective, and they knew what they were talking about. And uh, so that was the end of our presentation. Yeah.